Buenas tardes, good afternoon. This talk is about the GAM Digital Archive Project, which is a partnership between the Haverford College Libraries and the Grupo de Apoyo Mutuo, or the GAM. The GAM is one of Guatemala's oldest and most respected human rights groups, which was founded during Guatemala's armed internal conflict. My main role at Haverford is leading this project as a digital scholarship librarian, and our aim is to digitize, describe, and share access to a collection of around 3,300 uh, case files of forced disappearance during the armed internal conflict. So first, I'm gonna give you a little bit of historical context on the founding of the GUM, and the creation of their archive. Next, I'll tell you a little bit about the materials, our efforts to digitize and describe them, and the people, platforms, and tools that we've employed. And then finally, I'll turn things over to Mariana, so she can share some of her research and her role in the project as a digital scholarship compañera. So the Cold War context of the armed internal conflict is really critical to lay out. The official timeline spans from 1960 to 1996, uh, ending with the signing of the peace accords. But even that timeline is really complicated because it doesn't capture the longer history of US empire that led to what the CIA claims is its first successful operation in overthrowing government in 1954 with the coup against the democratically elected reformist Jacob Arbenz. The Cold War context also is only one chapter in a longer colonial history of violence patterned on the racism and socioeconomic context of an indigenous, indigenous and Ladino divide in Guatemala. The Commission for Historical Clarification found 200,000 victims um, of the conflict and attributed 93% of human rights violations to state security forces. So it's in this context that women looking for family members one of whom is behind me, Rosario Godoy de Cuevas, founded the GAM in 1984. They came together either with knowledge already of what had happened and testimony of what had happened to their loved ones, or without firsthand account or knowledge of what had happened, uh, in good faith petitioning state officials and state security forces for information about their loved ones, knowing the context of the violence and disappearance that was happening during the conflict. Within a few months of the founding of the GUM, they received a lot of intimidation, threats um, for kind of pushing, digging to, for, for too much information. And within the first year of its founding, a number of its leadership was um, disappeared brutally, mur actually not disappeared, brutally murdered, tortured and killed for, um, for intimidation purposes, including Rosario, who's one of the first martyrs of the organization. Nonetheless, the organization, the members of the GUM continued to search for their loved ones. And um, the killing of its leadership spurred demonstrations, um, indignation from a larger coalition that came together uh, from what started within the capital, largely created by Ladino women, to uh, um, the broader coalition of people who came to the capital, including more indigenous women, and uh, kind of an increased militancy that took them to the streets to really publicly shame and demand accountability for state officials as they became more and more aware of the patterns of violence that they were learning from each other. And it's at that moment that the GUM also um, expands its activities beyond the capital to open up satellite offices, to collect testimony, uh, and to work with other human rights organizations that have been founded outside of the capital to get a, a grip on what, what had been happening. And so it's at that moment, really, where the founders of the GUM came together and as they started to expand their knowledge of the pattern of violence that we can think of a creation of the archive as people brought newspaper clippings, their own personal testimony, letters that they had written um, into the founding of the organization. From that point in 1984 to its uh, continued operations today, the GAM has formalized, it's become institutionalized, it's had a number of programs that have come in and out of existence as funding has um, come in and out from international bodies like the um, UN Development Fund uh, from uh, governments including the United States, Canada, um, a few Scandinavian countries, German Peace Corps. And so today, the orientation of the GUM is focused very broadly on any kind of human rights violation that happens in Guatemala. So they do monthly violence reports. They have collections beyond the one that I'll be talking about around land disputes, violence against women, displaced children from the armed conflict. So it's in kind of that this present day context where the GUM has kind of a, a, a much longer trajectory of varied uh, activities and human rights violations beyond the disappeared, that in, in 2016, uh, a group of, kind of a breakout group within the GUM, looked for funding from the equivalent of the German Peace Corps 
to begin organizing the physical archive, to begin boxing up these materials, to take piles of paper that had been in their offices and had um, accompanied them in their, their moves to different offices into a collection, a set of collections on different uh, areas. So exhumations we see here, and then the collection on the disappeared. What you find in these folders varies across time and departments. So the archive is organized by boxes in one of 22 departments in Guatemala. Sometimes you see an intake form with lots of detailed demographic information, testimony that's handwritten, sometimes it's typed, passport photos, letters that are written to state officials, letters from international solidarity um, organizations. Other times you find a scrap of paper that was photocopied with the intent to transcribe and to try and um, investigate further what had happened. But there's a really a wide variance on, on what happens when you open a folder. So where Haverford got involved was this physical archive um, had begun the cataloging process, the organization process, cleaning with a lot of expertise that already existed at the GUM. But to digitize, describe, and preserve, they reached out through um, a professor at Haverford to the library to, uh, to get help. And serendipitously, Clear posted positions for data creation in Latin American and Caribbean studies that year. Haverford applied and was successful and hired me as a project lead. And so the goal from the outset has been to partner with the GUM in building capacity for digitization and description. Also to create a set of deliberals, including a digital archive, but that capacity building has really guided and the sustainability of the project has really guided the decisions we've made on what we actually want to launch um, in the near future here as I wrap up my time at Haverford. So the um, first tool I wanted to share a little bit about is the processing layer. So it was created with a view towards how uh, somebody who's processing the collection or how a researcher might use the collection, opens a folder and might want to see all the, fold all the documents that are spread out in front of them and be able to zoom in and out. Um, share links so you guys can um, play with this tool if you want. But you can come in and out of the, um, you can zoom in and out of the documents and also see the file naming system. The user is also oriented to how that file naming system reflects the physical archive and some of the provenance of the materials. And this is custom built in Django, which is a Python web framework. We also uh, considered a few other options, including Atom and uh, Mukadu, which a few other people have brought up in their presentations. And the reason we did that was because we had um, such a solid sense of the gum that we were going to have to anticipate a lot of different needs, not uh, just around uh, things like access, which uh, Mukadu is sensitive to, but also um, kind of a research application, a selective um, way of being able to transcribe, uh, attach metadata to, just a lot of different moving parts wanted, made this attractive to actually build this in-house. The other platform is the public site, which is nearing launch at the end of the month, which is set up in a much more narrative uh, format with descriptions uh, on a select number of cases. Uh, the photographs are more prominent. We really wanted to have this have more of a feel of an online exhibit rather than a processing tool, so people could be drawn into the stories that the archive can tell. That brings us to um, one critical set of the, member, of the team members. So our team includes staff at the GUM, obviously, a set of five other librarians who work at Haverford with me, and then seven digital scholarship compañeros who are paid undergraduate workers, um, all bilingual, largely CHISIC scholars, which is Haverford's program to recruit and retain students from underrepresented groups. And they have been the first researchers to conduct original research on the archive, and they've also been critical project workers in the glorious opportunities, but also the less glorious opportunities, which means transcribing metadata, entering um, some of that kind of work. So I'll turn it over now to Mariana to talk about that. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mariana, and I'm one of the undergraduate researchers that has been um, a part of the team since fall of 2017. Um, and I had an opportunity this summer to look at the case files um, in the digital archive more closely and conduct research on them. So I'm going to talk about how I approached the archive, um, some of the findings from my summer, and some future interest projects. So given the disproportionate violence that predominantly affected ind indigenous communities, I was curious to learn what an archive based in Guatemala City, a predominantly Latino urban space, could tell us about the violence that took place in the highlands, and if there were any cases that complicated the categorization of disappearance. 
To this end, I found that the GAM Digital Archive Collection had many case files from the municipality of Rabinal in the Department of Baja Verapaz. This municipality is home of the Maya Achi, one of the four indigenous communities where, the state, where state security forces committed acts of genocide during the armed conflict. I focused my research on what the content and production of the GAM case files could reveal about the complexities of the violence in Rabinal. Um, as Alex was mentioning, the case files that you typically find uh, in the archive vary largely case by case. There are a lot of photographs, um, legal documents, letters, um, all, all sorts of things. But I found that in the case of Rabinal, almost all of the documents were intake forms. And the purpose of the intake forms um, was so that the GAM could expedite the process of documenting crucial information relating to disappearances. These intake forms seek to answer basic questions such as who was it disappeared, what happened, when did the incident happen, and where did the incident, hap incident happen. When a family member's trauma-informed lived experience is categorized this way, they are, they are not granted the space to insert their emotions. In other words, the monotonous nature of bureaucratic intake forms obscures pain. However, um, despite this, we see family members of victims of violence resist telling only part of the story in an effort to document what is important to them. In all of the cases from Rabinal, the last page of the intake form is turned over and used to provide a fuller narrative description of the events as they transpired. These narrative events reveal that in Rabinal, disappearances were only one form of violence. Um, and an interesting tension that I found in the archive uh, is in the case of Mateo Alvarado. The intake forms from Rabinal and the GAM Disappearances Collection include likely victims of massacres. These intake forms offer us names as opposed to the usual numbers and statistics discourse. And through outside research, I was able to uh, learn that on September 15, 1981, anywhere from 200 to 800 people were massacred. And when I entered this date on the um, search toolbar, I found that the GAM had four cases that had violations occurring on the state on September 15, 1981. According to Mateo Alvarado's wife, um, this is a photograph of the text that somebody from the GAM wrote um, when they did the interview with her. At about 7 a.m., the victim was on his way to the central market in the municipality of Rabinal. He was going to sell his livestock at said market, and after he sold his livestock, he went to make some purchases with his wife. His wife headed home, and while the husband was making purchases, the victim was alone in that moment. It was in that moment that he was disappeared, but no one knows what happened. Now, given what we know about what was happening at the central market in Rabinal, it is highly likely that Mateo Alvarado was massacred. But this points to a tension in terminology. His wife does not say that he was massacred, opting instead for saying that he was disappeared. And some of the questions that I have been grappling with are if my knowledge as a researcher and my inclination to label him a victim of massacre could obstruct the wife's memory of her husband. And how can we as researchers balance our biases with respecting how survivors of massacres and other human rights violations choose to remember their loved ones? Um, and furthermore, I also found that there was resistance in the production of these intake forms themselves. Um, almost without fail, when asked to answer the question of steps taken after the violations, family members responded with variations of the following. Nothing, we were too afraid. Though the vast majority of violations occurred in the early 80s, it wasn't until the late 90s that family members felt safe enough making any sort of denunciations with the GAM. This means that for 15 or more years, family members of victims of violence often knew and or lived in close proximity with perpetrators and were unable to make any denunciations against them. And I argue that even in the mid-90s when these intake forms were produced, there was still um, a lot of danger in Rabinal um, because victim, uh, family members of the, dis of the massacred and disappeared were still being intimidated by the state. 
so that's a little bit of what I found this past summer in my research. And thankfully, with support of the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship at Haverford, um, I'm going to be able to travel to Guatemala along with two other undergraduate students. And my research has kind of shifted a little bit. Um, I'm looking forward to conducting research on dignification and revindication practices in Guatemala City. Um, I'm wondering how are the disappeared dignified? Who is doing this work? Who is defining what dignification looks like? Does it look different to different people? And what is the GAMS role in facilitating this process? Relatedly, how does revindication relate to transitional justice? And how does it relate to human rights more generally? Thank you.